We begin our masterwork season with a programme of two fifth symphonies and two piano concertos. Perhaps Beethoven's fifth caused composers to dig especially deep when they wrote their own fifths. This season, we're featuring fifth symphonies by Tchaikovsky, Schubert, Sibelius and Shostakovich. Unlike Beethoven's fifth, though, Schubert's doesn't reach for the edges of the cosmos, but is rather his most perfectly proportioned and elegant symphony. He had recently discovered Mozart, playing his symphonies in the orchestra of the Vienna Choir School, and writing of his infatuation in his diary, O oh, Mozart, immortal Mozart, what countless impressions of a brighter, better life hast thou stamped upon our souls. We can hear Mozart's influence throughout Schubert's Fifth, which he wrote between September and October 1816. He was 19 years old. The first movement opens with a series of woodwind chords. Not a slow introduction, but a beautiful four-bar upbeat that leads us into a sparkling melody in the first violins. The second movement features a simple melody in two parts, and it's here that we hear Schubert's thumbprints the most clearly. The tonal scheme, the keys Schubert chooses to travel into, is his own and very characteristic. He chooses keys a third apart instead of the more orthodox fifth, and moves flatwards instead of sharpwards. The third movement is titled Minuet, but it's really a one in a bar scherzo, telling us that Schubert had also played the first two symphonies of Beethoven, not just those of Mozart and Haydn. The finale is unabashedly cheerful, perfectly ending a work that is aware of life's darker moments, but chooses to keep them at arm's length. Timo Andres is an American composer and pianist, now in his 30s, living in Brooklyn. The Blind Bannister was written as part of a project overseen by pianist Jonathan Biss, the soloist in our concerts, in which modern composers create piano concertos inspired by Beethoven's five piano concertos. The Blind Bannister was composed by Andres and first performed in 2015 as a companion piece to Beethoven's second piano concerto, which we also hear on this program. Timo has described the relationship between the two concertos as follows. I'm fascinated by composers who feel compelled to revise their works years or decades after the fact. Beethoven gave his early second piano concerto a kind of renovation in the form of a new cadenza 20 years down the line, around the time he was working on the Emperor Concerto. It's wonderfully jarring in that he makes no concessions to his earlier style. For a couple of minutes, we're plucked from a world of conventional gestures into a future world of obsessive fugues and spiraling modulations. Like any good cadenza, it's made from those same simple gestures, an arpeggiated triad, a sequence of downward scales, but Beethoven uses them as the basis for a miniature fantasia. My third piano concerto, The Blind Bannister, is a whole piece built over this fault line in Beethoven's second, trying to peer into the gap. I tried as much as possible to start with those same extremely simple elements that Beethoven uses. However, my piece is not a pastiche or an exercise. It doesn't even directly quote Beethoven. There are some surface similarities to his concerto, a three movement structure, a B flat tonal center, but those are mostly red herrings. The best way I can describe my approach to writing the piece is, I started writing my own cadenza to Beethoven's concerto and ended up devouring it from the inside out. The concerto begins with the piano soloist alone, playing repeated notes that gradually descend down the scale. The whole first movement is characterized by a sense of sinking and an obsessive rhythmical energy that never lets up. The second movement, titled Ringing Weights, is a fast scherzo beginning with a frantic and high-pitched violin solo against bell-like chords in the piano. After a virtuosic cadenza, the third movement is slower and very expressive. There's a yearning quality to the music, and it often sounds like an exhaling breath. This leads into a brilliant coda that brings the concerto to its conclusion in a thrilling crescendo. It was my pleasure to perform the Blind Bannister with our soloist Jonathan Biss and the New York Philharmonic in April 2017. It's always an exciting experience working on a new piece with the composer at rehearsals. 
Since Timo's concerto was designed to be performed alongside Beethoven's second, we decided to bring them both, along with Jonathan Biss, the soloist, to Jacksonville. Beethoven's second piano concerto was actually the first he composed as a young man in his early 20s during the 1790s. What we now call the first concerto was written in 1795, but published before the second. In 1787, Beethoven visited Vienna, most likely meeting Mozart and taking piano lessons from him. And in 1792, he moved from Bonn to Vienna, where he would live for the rest of his life. He brought with him sketches for the B-flat major piano concerto. By March 1795, Beethoven was beginning to establish himself in the city and was featured as both composer and pianist in a charity concert held for the Vienna Composers Society. Although we can't be sure, most scholars think he used this opportunity to premiere the second piano concerto. Mozart's influence is clear from beginning to end as would be expected of a composer living and working in Vienna, where Mozart had created so many exquisite piano concertos. The concerto is in three movements, fast, slow, fast. In the slow movement, we hear Beethoven's own voice emerging in the beautiful long singing lines in piano and orchestra. But ironically, it's the finale that sticks most in the ear with its offbeat accents and rustic quality. Beethoven famously wrote it only two days before the premiere, passing sheet after sheet of manuscript to a team of four copyists who sat in the room behind him, frantically writing out the orchestra parts. Sibelius's Fifth Symphony was a commission from the Finnish government to celebrate the composer's 50th birthday. It was a difficult time for Sibelius, who'd spent nearly 30 years in the public spotlight. But now he found himself getting bad reviews due to the stylistic differences between his own music and that of the avant-garde. He began to feel eclipsed as a contending modernist by the bright stars of Schoenberg and Stravinsky. But in April 1915, he confided in his diary, this morning I saw a flock of 16 swans, one of the greatest impressions of my life. Sibelius lived in a house on the edge of a forest, an hour's drive north of Helsinki. In one of the larger rooms, there still hangs a portrait of flying swans. This image would later inspire the theme that drives the apotheosis of the Fifth Symphony. After its premiere, Sibelius was unhappy with the symphony, revising it extensively and combining the original first two movements into one. The resulting movement is a technical tour de force that is difficult to describe without disappearing down a rabbit hole of musicological jargon. But everything is based on the opening theme we hear in the horns. As in his other symphonies, Sibelius's way of moving through time by combining different speeds of music is extraordinary. The first movement is a gradual transformation from the hollows of slow and somber music to a vivid scherzo that becomes more and more hectic as it approaches its thrilling end. The second movement seems simple after the first. It's a quiet meditation between the drama of the first and last movements. We hear a theme played quietly in pizzicato strings, inspired by the swans, and this theme will make a much grander appearance in the finale. But in the second movement, it's used as the basis for a set of variations. The finale is triumphant, piecing together moments from earlier movements. Sibelius once described the process of bringing all these threads together writing in his diary on April 10th, 1915. Spent the evening with the symphony, the disposition of the themes, this important preoccupation with its mystery and fascination, as if God the Father had thrown down pieces of mosaic out of heaven's floor and asked me to solve how the picture once looked. The picture is finally solved, and we hear the majestic themes Sibelius imagined as he saw the 16 swans fly by. The symphony ends in a startling, unusual way. After the harmonic richness and fluctuations of speed, Sibelius chooses to conclude his work with a series of powerful but stark chords in the orchestra, oddly separated in time, so we're left holding our breath, unsure when the next will strike. 
When the work ends, everything is over suddenly, and we're left with a peculiar feeling of being drawn back into the drama of a symphony that has just finished.